Good morning, everybody. Uh, as you may have gathered uh, from my accent, uh, I'm from the UK. I'm from London. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here to uh, talk to you all about the changing talent landscape. Uh, that is me. Um, Exceptional Talent is the book that I co-authored with a guy called Matt Alder, who actually spoke here last year, if any of you were here last year. Digital Talent is the book we're writing at the moment, which is being published on the 3rd of December. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today will, will come from that book. Um, these are the kind of things that uh, I do. Uh, I work primarily with uh, HR recruitment technology companies, uh, researching and writing about the emerging trends in recruitment talent. Um, I advise them, uh, I write, uh, I speak, uh, and I do lots of things. And apparently, I'm one of the top 100 HR tech influencers in the world. I watch a lot of sport, uh, primarily football, American football and cricket. My favorite cricket team is Yorkshire County Cricket Club in, in England. Although I'm born and bred in London, there is a historical reason why I follow Yorkshire. My favorite player is Johnny Bairstow. Uh, and of course, he played in the IPL, and he came to Mumbai about six weeks ago, and I think was out for a duck, third or fourth ball. So I'm hoping I don't suffer the same fate. Um, Let's start by being provocative. Uh, Peter Capelli, who's professor at Wharton School in America, who's written a lot about recruitment, talent acquisition, HR. Current issue of Harvard Business Review. I opened it on the plane over here to read it, and the first thing that hits me is, your approach to hiring is all wrong. Now, how many times have we been told this over the last 10, 15 years, usually by people like me? Uh, but here is uh, a, a, an academic who spends his life researching this. Um, businesses have never done as much hiring, they've never spent as much money, and they've never done a worse job. Um, interestingly, the data he was using, I think it's primarily US, says that the majority of people who took a new job last year weren't searching for one. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the piece that he's written, the paper he's written, is to do with the kind of search for passive candidates, the search for looking for candidates who maybe aren't looking for a job, and are they really better hires? Um, a lot of our talent acquisition teams globally are always looking, the belief is that a passive candidate who's happy in a job somewhere, is doing a good job, isn't looking to leave. If, if they're looking to leave, there might be a reason why, and maybe people who aren't looking to leave uh, are better performers. Uh, and it's, it's up to us to, to, I suppose, ensure, is this right? Is this something that, that stacks up with our own experience? If we look at people that we've brought into the business over the last five, seven years, how many of those who've performed really well were, were passives who weren't looking when we hired them, and how many applied to job adverts? Today's world of talent, I appreciate that I've got some slides with quite a few bullet points. You will get the slides afterwards. And if you come to my masterclass at 3 o'clock this afternoon, we'll be going through some of this in a bit more detail. Um, today's world of talent, there's a number of challenges. Uh, digital transformation, digital skills, what are they? What are the future skills? Job seekers are much more informed. Uh, there is another UK uh, keynote speaker, Bill Borman, uh, who will be speaking to you later this afternoon, and he will have a lot of uh, data on this. But basically, job seekers do a lot more research into you, your business, what it's like to work there. Um, talent management approaches are changing. Uh, most uh, people who work in HR are changing the way they do performance management. They're looking to move people around the business a lot more than they were before. Uh, internal mobility. Uh, onboarding, particularly early onboarding, uh, is, is, is a key challenge for us. Um, onboarding sometimes doesn't work, and whenever I've interviewed uh, businesses who say they, they struggle to get it right, they say it's because it kind of falls between two stools. It's kind of recruitment are doing the hiring process, HR take over at some stage, and there's this great big gap in between. Now, I saw some research last year uh, that had been done with a small number of medium-sized companies where they had spoken to job seekers who had joined the company to ask how they felt about the uh, recruitment process right from the first job ad till they'd been there for three months. The two weakest points, the two points where they felt least engaged with the business they were out to join, uh, were both the points at which they said they had very little information coming from the company. The first one was in between the first and second interview, and the second one was during their notice period. If you think about it, we've hired somebody, they're waiting to join, and they feel less, less engaged with us than they did before, because they're not getting any inf information from us. So onboarding is important, and in talent acquisition, we need to be starting that process the minute we interview them. Somebody we interview is going to be the next hire. Uh, culture of learning, employees, the, most, the number one thing they look for in a company these days, um, the number one reason they'll stay is the opportunity to learn, to grow and develop. 
Um, inclusion, uh, we'll know that here a lot about this today. This is a key thing for us, again, talent acquisition. We are the people bringing people into the business. How are we making sure we have an inclusive culture? Uh, well-being, meaning, purpose. These are all things that, that we are looking at within the business. These are all things that we are uh, talking to people about that maybe we weren't a few years ago. Have we changed the way we approach these things? Are we, doing, are we making sure our own recruiters are kind of enjoying their work? They feel there's meaning, purpose in their work. Their well-being is looked after. They're not being uh, had, had undue pressure put on them. Distributed nature of work, I'll speak about in a moment. The way work is done is different, and we sometimes don't have an overview over what is going on. And automation. Automation is there. Esther has mentioned it before. What are we automating, and how are we using that automation? Uh, to quote my friend Bill, because I don't think he'll be saying it this afternoon, if you automated 80% of a recruiter's time, what would you do with that 80%? Now, one thing you can do is just get rid of 80% of your recruitment team and say, we've saved money, there's the ROI on automation. But you could give that person back 80% of their time to do much more value-added things to transform your TA team. Digital transformation you can't escape from. Here's just a selection of headlines on any given week from business magazines, every sector, every, 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 every industry, wherever you are, every size of organization is facing this. And it's happening. Deloitte's 2017, 51% you know, of companies are in the process of redesigning. 18 months later, 94% of executives say it's a top priority. The noise is growing, the chatter is growing. Digital transformation is something that is happening. Um, I've, used, uh, I've used a definition from Tom Goodwin, who's the author of a book called Digital Darwinism. Um, and he points out there, in fact, he's the person who first wrote the tweet about Uber is the world's largest transportation company but has no cars, Airbnb. Uh, and that was just a think piece. He, he put it out there on LinkedIn, I think, uh, as a kind of, this is what I'm thinking, what does everybody else think? But obviously a lot of people have taken that tweet and used it as a kind of um, uh, their own. Um, but it, it, it's, the point he makes is that digital transformation doesn't mean that everything we've done before is wrong and we've got to change it. It's more a mindset of if we were starting the business today, how would we start it? What would be our business model? What would be our operating model? And how can we transform to that? But the problem with digital, uh, quite often if I talk to people about it, they say, we've heard all this before. Millennium bug was the same thing. Planes were going to fall out the sky. The world was going to end. And guess what? Nothing happened. Well, the reason nothing happened was a lot of work was put into it. But with the millennium bug, we had a fixed time. We knew what the deadline was. Everybody faced the same problem, and so people collaborated. We had the skills in place to be able to do that. Digital transformation is different. The pace of change is, is, is fast. There is no end date. It is agile. It is continuous. It changes all the time. We don't have the skills in-house. People aren't collaborating because they're in competition, competition with each other. And we need cultures of in innovation, experimentation, and organizationally, we don't tend to have them. How work gets done now is like this. This is a chart of uh, interaction points within a large organization. Uh, somebody in your team who's working on a project might well be, have four, five, six different reference points they're interacting with. Their manager might not be on the team. Their manager might not actually know how they're performing. They might be working cross-team, cross-division, cross-function, cross-country, and you don't know. It's not a nice, strict, hierarchical thing. You can't Somebody doesn't report there, there, there. And it's easy to lose sight of what people are doing within the organization and what parts of the organization need what skills. And as the TA team, that's what we need to know. Now, the five major challenges, and there are hundreds of them, but here are five uh, for talent. We'll come on to the TA team itself in a minute. And future skills, leadership pipelines, Every uh, CEO, every executive survey, every senior C-suite survey says the same things. The main things they worry about are future talent and the pipeline of their leadership. That obviously is squarely down to us. We're the people who bring them in. Redefining talent. What is talent in the digital age? Uh, there's a lot of stuff at the moment in the UK. You might have noticed we're going through a bit of political turmoil. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about how, do we, how have we got the politicians that we've got? What's happened to the old school politicians who had a vision and kind of knew what they were doing? 
And the thing is selection mechanisms. In our organisations, we have selection mechanisms which tend to say, you know what, somebody who's in a company doing well is probably going to do well here. We'll interview them face to face. If they're confident, if they can answer all our questions well, we'll assume they're good. And quite a lot of teams will still operate on that basis. Yet, what does talent mean? In the digital world, it's not necessarily somebody who seems very competent at something they were doing last year. It's somebody who's going to embrace what might, they might be doing next year. And how do we assess that? We'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, retention and onboarding. It, it's harder to retain people. Um, and maybe that's not such a bad thing. Organizations might begin to accept that, that you know, people will, you know, it's the relationship with an individual they're retaining as opposed to the person themselves. People might move around an organization, they might leave, they might come back. Um, we need to think about what retention means for the organization. Onboarding is a hugely significant issue because we need people who can be productive quite quickly. Um, and the way that this happens is very different now. It's not a case of bringing somebody in after three months, you assess them. People nowadays, they're much better informed. When they join, they want to know everything they're going to be doing, exactly how they're going to be doing it, who with. They want to hit the ground running. They're more informed. They will be checking you out. Um, that they, Not necessarily the point they apply. Again, Bill has a lot of data on this this afternoon. Certainly the research that I've been involved with, with uh, 14,000 job seekers, showed that they will be checking out as much as possible what you're like to work for, what kind of company you are, what people say about you online. Not so much what you say about yourself, it's what other people say. They'll check uh, review sites, uh, Glassdoor obviously in, in, in the US and Europe, uh, but there are many others. They will do Google searches on you. Uh, they will look at things like I used to work at and put the name of your company in and they can find people on their personal blogs, uh, write personal blogs about their hobbies, photography. And we'll say, you know, when I used to work at so-and-so, I didn't do much photography because we, we had a lot of deadlines. Somebody might, a, a throwaway comment on a personal blog you might never have seen from an employee who left you a couple of years ago and somebody will look at that and say, ah, hard work, deadlines, you don't get much time to yourself. It's people that will make decisions. And changing attitudes to work, uh, the way we look at work, the way people entering the workforce, and it's not an age thing, I'll come to that in a moment, is slightly different. And, and what people want out of a career is slightly different. A lot of that is socioeconomic trends globally. Uh, people entering the workforce today will have different priorities to people 30, 40 years ago, not because they're young now, but because the socioeconomic financial pressures on them and options are not the same that they were 30, 40 years ago. Internal mobility is important. Uh, some people might overplay it, but I think it, it's crucially important that a lot of the time talent is within the organization, but it's in silos. We don't necessarily see that the person we're searching for out there is actually already in the organization, in a different team, in a different division, doing something different, but they have the skill set we need. So a lot of the... Um, a lot of organizations are be trying to embrace this. There's a lot of research out there that says your best hire for a team will be somebody who's already in the business. Um, that's up to you to decide. But we don't, in the, in, in the talent, acquisi talent acquisition team, we don't often look at who is in the business already. That is probably because a lot of managers who are rewarded for having high-performing teams uh, are, tend to hoard their best people, they tend to hoard talent as opposed to produce it. So they don't want their people to move to another team in the organization or another division. So they tend to kind of not let, let that person be as visible within the organization. So we need to reward managers to produce talent for the whole organization and not just for their own teams. And it's not forget the millennial stuff. It's a mindset. It's not a date of birth. These are three quotes. In fact, the, the final quote is from Pew Re Research Group in the US, in their 2010 report that launched the whole me, me, me generation, millennials are different, they're going to change the way you look at everything, they actually said in that report that they are aware that there are as many differences in attitudes, values, behaviors, and lifestyles within a generation as they are between them. Uh, the top one is from Dr. Emma Parry, Cranfield Business School in the UK. They did a long piece of research trying to find uh, uh, any relationship between kind of age and attitudes to work, and they found that is a general evolution shaped by a lot of external factors, no specific factor. So don't 
please don't organise your, your TA function around the fact we need people who are leaving college now, therefore we've got to do completely different crazy wacky things because they're millennials, they're, they're Gen Z and they're going to want these things. The important thing, uh, what we have historically called soft skills, but in the UK, thanks to a piece recently in, in the Financial Times, uh, we're calling them robot-proof skills now. Um, primarily soft skills means they're a bit soft, oh, who cares really, empathy, communication, feedback, oh, they're a bit, you know, they're, they're, they're often, a, or they're cast almost as feminine skills, you know, women are very good at those things. And this is wrong, because these are the skills everybody needs. In the future world of work, these are the skills people need. These are the things robots, chatbots, algorithms won't be able to do. And this is what we need, and that's why we need to find ways to assess these. I'm being given a time thing, so I might speak a bit quicker now. Um, and the problem we have is that the traditional interview, this is data from LinkedIn that they published in their Global Recruiting Trends at the end of last year. One of the main reasons why traditional interviews fail is that we can't uh, they use soft skills. I haven't changed that to robot-proof skills. Um, but face-to-face -face interviews don't really give an opportunity to properly assess those kind of skills. Yes, there's communication, but it's very much question-answer, question-answer. Even in a conversation, it's not a natural conversation. It's quite stilted. Um, it's interesting that over half of the people, and this is, I think, about 20,000 people globally this was done with, felt that they don't understand candidate weaknesses from face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, which is obviously one of the things we need to know. It, it makes the process too long. There are new ways of uh, interviewing or new ways of assessing candidates. Um, obviously, in this session, uh, I can't go into it in too much detail, but if you come to my masterclass this afternoon, we'll talk about these a bit more. Uh, soft skill assessments, job auditions, um, casual settings I'm not that convinced about. What I would say about that, though, is that a number of the companies who specialise in video interviewing, their data shows that when it's the, um, the video interviewing where you record the questions and the candidate can record their answers in their own time, most candidates will do it at times that suit them. Between 6 and 10 o'clock on a Sunday evening uh, in the UK and US is the time most people tend to answer those questions. And the interesting thing is they're very relaxed, they're very kind of, you know, there's no pressure on them, and they've got time to devote to that. Whereas normally when we interview people uh, in an office, it's not like that. It's not at times that suit them. It won't be 6 o'clock on a Sunday evening. It will be they're, they're, they've got to go to work afterwards, they've just left work, they've taken half a day off, they're under pressure, and it doesn't feel a natural setting. Um, and that's some of the stuff that they have. What, what, what's good about them is it's more realistic, um, candidates can try a job, and it's less bias. But it's not quite the end of the interview, uh, because people still use it, but interestingly enough, the most effective things on the whole of the research, I mean, structured interview was, um, at the bottom, case study, work assignment, people find these, not many people do them, but when they do them, they find them very effective. So, what's wrong with the candidate experience? Uh, over three quarters of the people who will apply to you will say the reputation of the company where they work impacts their job satisfaction. And funny, only one in five people working in organisations actually see an alignment between what the, the company says about themselves and what the actual working experience is. Um, how you treat your staff is the, one of the most important things they're looking for. Uh, over half of people abandon applications if it's too long. Uh, five to ten minutes is the most length of time they expect on an application. Um, and of the people who drop out of interviews, almost a third will drop out of an interview process. Um, usually it's because it's too long and they get other offers. If it's not because it's too long, it will be primarily because there's something they have heard or read about your organisation that has put them off. Digital talent journey, I'm almost out of time, so I'll go a bit quickly now. Um, for the TA team, then you have to look at kind of attention and attraction, moving on to recruitment and onboarding, engagement development, alumni advocacy once somebody is leaving. This is an ongoing journey. Technology means that this is a seamless journey. It's not different stages. It's not different processes. And the thing is, it is one journey for the candidate, but internally, you've got 
TA team, which might have you know, a sourcing part and then an assessment part. You're then handing over to HR. HR is handing over to line managers. That's not how the candidate sees the employee life cycle. They see it as one, uh, they see it as one thing. And from our side, we see it as quite messy with different stakeholders, different processes. That's not how the employee sees it. Remember that. So, new approach to talent acquisition. If you were part of the Twitter chat last week, you would have seen me mention a few of these things. From reactive to proactive, we have to move from filling vacancies to being part of the overall business talent strategy. Not just waiting for hiring managers to tell us what they need. We, we, we need to be going to hiring managers, telling them what they need, telling them what is happening in the future, the kind of skills that we need to bring in. So that's proactive internal consulting and relationship building, not waiting for people to come to us. Understanding future skill requirements, planning for them, being on top of what is happening in the business world, not just looking at the recruitment, the TA world, actually knowing what's happening and what's likely to happen, being able to go to divisional heads and say, right, this is what's happening in your division over the next three years. Let's put a plan into place now. How are we going to get the talent you're going to need? Uh, know how to access strengths, capabilities, those kind of robot-proof skills. Don't just interview people and, and, and hire the most confident people, because quite often confidence at interview doesn't imply competence. Uh, have a recruitment process that attracts, not one that deters. Not the labours of Hercules, where every time they've done something, you make them do something else. I would have said, not like Game of Thrones, that's last man standing, but of course, at the end, it wasn't quite the last person standing. It, wasn't, it was a slightly different thing. I'm sorry if you haven't watched the last episode. Um, automate workflows, as I said, if we're going to automate it, how can we add value to what we do, rather than just cut costs, cut corners, and cut time? Uh, creating meaningful content. It's have stuff about you, not... not Here's the ping pong table in the coffee area. Here are some people relaxing on an away day. Oh, we had such fun the night we all went to play um, tennis or something. You know, have real content that makes people see you're a serious organization that takes the development of your people seriously. And total talent management, understand permanent, contract, freelance, gig, consultants. Use the whole mix within your organization. And so, the five things the talent acquisition team should be, and we will go into a lot more depth this afternoon at the masterclass in which you will help me create the TA team of the future. Business-focused, marketing-led, experts on future skills, future business, and how to find them at the right time. Understanding the hiring and job-seeking trends, being on top of them, do your own research, create your own content, read other research papers out there and find out what candidates are doing, what they expect from the recruitment process and make sure you're on top of that. And know in your business what drives retention and what's the employee experience, and, but what's the right employee experience. And don't be scared, don't be scared to say to the HR team, you know something, yeah, pe people that I interview, people from other organizations, they say that they've got this at the organization, we don't have that. And that's the fact we don't have that is putting people off. Have a voice. That is me. I'm around all day. I'm around till this evening before I fly back. And I hopefully see quite a few of you in the masterclass this afternoon. Thank you for your time.